Thank you for joining us to hear God's Word together. If you're new with us as Christians, the most important thing for us is listening to God. How? By listening to His Word. And His Word will always point us to Him, and especially the truest revelation of Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Staying Alive. The Bee Gees most famous song, I think, is called Staying Alive. Do you know that song? It was part of a movie called Saturday Night Fever, and it was released in 1977. Is, is this coming across a bit loud? Is this slightly? Yeah, just slightly. Yeah. And so here, a portion of the lyrics, whether you are a brother, whether you are a mother, and this is talking about life in New York, right? You're staying alive, staying alive. You just stay alive in New York. Feel the city breaking, everybody's shaking, and we're staying alive, staying alive. And can you sing this chorus with me? Ha, 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 staying alive. Where, where was it? Sorry. Hey, 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 it goes backwards. Hey, hey. Okay. And it goes, ha, 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 staying alive. Uh, and life going nowhere, somebody help me, somebody help me, yeah. Life going nowhere, at least in New York, somebody help me, somebody help me. When it was first released, I think the world has never heard such high-pitched falsettos by anyone or any group. But it earned $127 million, sold 40 million copies, and that album itself, Saturday Night Fever, had five consecutive number ones, second only to the Beatles. But there are some good things that came out of Staying Alive, Staying Alive, and um, yeah, the song Staying Alive, unthinkably, is used in a study to train medical professionals to do what? To provide the correct number of chest compressions per minute while performing CPR. And the song's 103 beats per minute is what the British Heart Foundation recommends. It falls between 100 and 120 when you do CPR and endorsed by the British Resuscitation Council. The study found that the quality of CPR is always better when they play Staying Alive, Staying Alive, Staying Alive. I'm not kidding, at least that's what I found on Wikipedia, right? <laughs> Sorry, we're going backwards. And so, there it is. So Staying Alive, a song, a bit light-hearted. American Israeli Hirsch Goldberg, Goldberg Polin was wounded and abducted by Hamas in the October 7 attack. And uh, he was held hostage for 11 months. And the mother's plea to him was, stay alive, son. Stay strong. Stay alive. If you kept up with the news, you would know his body was recovered from a tunnel in Rafah in the Gaza Strip on 31st August 2024. Which leads us to ask whether you sing Staying Alive with the falsetto do CPR or whether you are a hostage. Have you ever tried to stay alive? Have you ever tried to help someone stay alive? And as I asked that question, how hard did you try to make someone stay alive? A loved one in hospital? A child? A parent? A friend? But for those who are perhaps more hardened by life, more cynical in life because of being hardened by life, you might want to ask, why stay alive in the first place? Why spend so much effort staying alive? Because isn't euthanasia in old age and suicide for any age an alternative? Which leads us to a dilemma as we start our time together, right? Do we want to live or do we want to die? And at some points or at many points, we can't figure that out from Acts 21 to Acts 28, nine chapters, it documents Paul the Apostle's experience of staying alive, with implications not just for him, but for us 2,000 years later, as to why nine chapters out of 28 chapters are about him and him staying alive. And today our portion is staying alive before assassins, chapter 23, verse 12 to 35. Staying alive before Governor Felix, 24, where we'll spend the most time. 
and a hint of it in summary for next week, staying alive before Festus and then Agrippa from chapter 25 onwards. So in summary, it's very important to know that from chapter 21 onwards, Paul faces what we will seldom face. He faces five trials. First, before a marauding Jewish mob that is bent not just on arresting him, but arresting him with the goal and aim of lynching him to death. You want to, watch, you want to know what lynching is? I highly commend because it's almost as frequently and once a year you get a movie out of Hollywood about Afro-Americans and how they've been discriminated against and how lynching of them by white societies and suburbs was a common occurrence. Before the Sanhedrin, chapter 23, verse 1 to 10, the immediate passage before this, and then before Felix, before Festus, before Agrippa, and each trial was life and death. Of course, our whole nation has been rocked by the trial and the sentencing of a former minister, Iswaran. Saddening to all of us, and got 12 months. I'm no legal expert, I speak in lay terms, and if I speak out of, out of, lay, out of my space, please forgive me. And some experts will say the punishment doesn't fit the crime. This, it's just, yeah, I mean, in other countries, it wouldn't amount to anything, but this is not any other country. This is Singapore. And the judgment of the judge was what he was sentenced with was not simply for himself, but it was an expression of custodial justice. That because of his position, the abuse of power at that point had implications. But it was not life and death for Minister Iswaran. For Paul, every single trial was life and death. Not between three months, six months, 12 months, but whether he is guilty and if he's found guilty. And so with each of them, you can say his life was hanging by a thread. And you see them most clearly now as you begin this portion. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor to drink. Till what? Then, till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. And so they make this vow. It's for an explicit purpose. Now therefore you, along with the council, Give notice to the tribune, right? Give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly and as he's being brought down to the narrow streets of Jerusalem, we are ready to ambush him and to kill him. So in context, it's important to understand this. Paul had just defended himself against the marauding mob in the earlier part of this chapter. Then, before the Sanhedrin, comprising the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and 71 elders of the Sanhedrin, the most powerful religious political bloc of leaders in Israel at that time, they had their collective venom against Paul. But the moment Paul raised the topic of resurrection, it divided them. Because the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. And so, was it a deliberate attempt by Paul? That as he preached the gospel, he mentioned the resurrection, and then it was divide and conquer. So from the collective laser beam opposition against him, that was to sentence him to death, they were now divided among themselves. That was the backdrop immediately before we plunge into this. By chapter 3, verse 12 onwards, it opens, and the Jews were frustrated. Let me ask you, were you frustrated the last six days? Turn to your neighbor and say, I was. Surely you were. As part of your fallenness, you would have a fair dose of frustration. And when you're frustrated or irritated by something or someone, uh, how do you de-escalate that? Do you de-escalate or you just continue escalating? And ask for the source of why were you so frustrated? What frustrated the Jews? was their own attempts to lynch Paul 
fell true. Secondly, the appeal to the most powerful Sanhedrin to convict Paul also fell true. And now because those two things fell true, they took things into their own hands. Can you see? Which leads us to a side point, may I make. You must never underestimate what? You must never underestimate what frustrated ambition and desire is capable of making you do. You must never underestimate what your personal frustrated desire, ambition or goal might make you do to the treachery of someone and to the death of someone. It now escalates into die-hard group of assassins who swear personal abstention from food and drink until, until satisfaction of their threat to their religious belief is gone and the threat is Paul. But there's only one thing that went wrong with their plot. Paul's nephew happens to chance upon this information. He so happens to be there. Don't ask how, don't ask why, we are not told. So don't speculate in a Bible study group and then fight. Not much use. You're just told that Paul's nephew got wind of this. Then he rushed to expose this plot to Paul. And then Paul exposed it to the two centurions. And then exposed it to, in my version, the commander or the tribune, who then exposed it to the governor. And so it's a series of exposés of a plot that took part in people's hearts and now was manifesting in a small circle against God's servant. So how do you stay alive here? When the tribune heard this, he ordered a posse of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen. You say 400 people to guard one person, charged with something, that's a bit excessive, right? No police force in the world will ever have this. I do not know whether you remember years and years ago, 2001, right? And um, yeah, Mona and me were driving back. Uh, I remember McRitchie, and we saw every 10 or 20 meters, another policeman, another policeman, another policeman. So I was saying, is, is there a VIP in town? Is the president of the US here? And then we found out from the news, every 10, 20 meters, there was either a policeman or a soldier because Mas Salamat has, had escaped. You remember Mas Salamat or not? Maybe you were not born then. But it was soon after 9-11 and he was plotting to do terrorism in Singapore. And he had unthinkably to Singapore's reputation blown a hole and he had escaped. And where he escaped from is not far from here. That's why I felt so guarded as I drove home. Never felt more secure along Adam Road. Soldier, soldier. Depending on the danger, was this an excessive force? 470 of them, or 270 if the spearmen are more horsemen. They travel 60 miles, 90 kilometers from Jerusalem to Caesarea, the seat of power. And this is how he was kept alive. The final thing that kept him alive in this first episode is then I, Claudius Lysias, I write to you, Felix, a letter which tells you the importance of letter writing. And Claudius Lysias said, I rescued Paul, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. I brought him down to the Sanhedrin. I found that he was being accused about questions about their Jewish law, so nothing to do with civil law, so not deserving death or imprisonment. I, ordered his, I discovered the plot, I ordered his accusers to state their case, and all these things. And in John Stott's commentary, he says, a very honourable civil service letter. And we count at least nine eyes in that letter, which means a very honourable civil service letter, which is totally self-interested. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, basically saying to the governor, I did my duty, can you give me a promotion? But no matter how self-serving it was, God in his sovereignty turned it 
to serve for the protection of Paul from this marauding mob that now turned into assassination plot. It is vitally important for us to realize that God can work through a nephew, a niece, a right time, right place, and it gets passed down to Paul, passed down to the guard, passed down to the tribune, passed on to the governor. And Paul's life is spared. He stayed alive despite the most cunning of plots with the most vicious of assassins. Then how did he stay alive before Felix? And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And we had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way, everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. Apparently, this kind of opening statement in a court case is, is normal. But in John Stott's words, again, this is nauseating flattery. <laughs> and why is it nauseating flattery? Because it, it was common knowledge that Felix was a cruel and brutal ruler who put down uprisings with the greatest force. So for him to say that he had brought peace, yeah, he brought peace, but the fragile peace that he brought was by the force of the sword. So nauseating starting point. In, in Singlish, he was sarkala. He was tripoding his boss, right? Or tripoding the ruler. And then he goes on. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. We have found this man a plague. Have you ever called anybody a plague? Has anybody called you a plague? A plague. And it does three things. Who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, is ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews, represented by their prosecutor, Tertullus, had three charges. One, Paul is a political troublemaker, and Rome was very nervous about Jewish agitators, especially if they claim to be the Messiah. Then he was ringleader of this illegal religious Nazarene sect. Judaism was a legal religion under Rome but anything else was illegal, and the growing group of Jewish converts to Christ was now troubling Israel. And when it was troubling Israel, it troubled the Roman authorities. He was also desecrator of the temple because it was rumored that he brought a Gentile into the temple, the temple courts, the inner courts, and no Gentiles are supposed to enter. So, and he said, and he said in his letter, and he said this thing, they seized him. The, the, the real situation is they didn't, they didn't just seize Paul to arrest him. They actually seized Paul to lynch him. So he muted the wrongdoing, Tertullus, he muted the wrongdoing against Paul. Which leads us to Satan's sophisticated sin against Jesus and his people. It was the religious leaders, the chief priests, the priests, the Pharisees, in cahoots with Judas. And so they used religiosity and legality to nail Jesus to the cross. Same thing here with Paul. And throughout 2,000 years of church history, may we be prayerful and mindful that Satan continues to work through sophisticated sin. The best thing is to say about Christians, about Christian leaders, uh, what he did was illegal. Then everybody panics. But legality is not simplistically equal to morality. Legality is not simplistically equal to righteousness. And so there was a good line, right, from one of our new staff, right, that was giving the, the, uh, their story. And uh, Sindrik was struck by something Pastor Kenneth said, that if we merely hear God's word, we just become much smarter sinners. 
That's what happens when you are a superficial listener to God's Word, but not a follower of Christ. You become smarter with your sin and smarter with sophisticated sin, where you will plead religious, religiosity or legality to cover up immorality and depravity. And Paul's defense? No, no. I'm not a troublemaker. He's not a member. He's a member, but not the ringleader of this thing called the way. All who followed Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And Paul confesses what? He confesses, you know what about me? My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone, and they cannot prove to you the charges they're making against me. I'm reading directly from Scripture now, chapter 24. However, I admit, let me just read his admission, his confession. What is it he admits? Right? Straight from God's Word, from my old trusted Bible. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers, same God that we worship, as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe that everything that agrees with the law and the prophet and written in the, prophet, in the prophets, that I have the same hope in God as this man, that there is a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. And so, in summary, he confesses, he shares the same God, the same worship of the same God, the same faith in the same God, the same hope, and the same goal to live a life that is pleasing to God. So he's not anti-temple, he's not anti-Israel, he's not anti-God. The distinctive thing about Paul that they couldn't accept, that got him and early Christians into trouble was, it's always this, it is this that will get us into trouble. It is this that stands us apart that we should never be ashamed of. What is it? Or else let this man themselves say, what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council? Other than this one thing that I cried out was standing among them. It is respect to the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you today is always the resurrection of the crucified Jesus that earns us the scorn, the skepticism of the world. The man who was crucified for us to quench God's wrath, to wash away our sin, to crush Satan's work, and then rise to new life so that we'll not live forever under Satan's rule. And so it is always the resurrection, which leads me to ask, Maybe a side question before we head towards the final things that flow from this passage. When was the last time you were truly thankful to Jesus and His resurrection? The last six days? The last month? Did you ever remember that Jesus rose from the dead? I think if we are all honest, you and me don't make much about Jesus' resurrection until you face the death of a loved one. And as you see the casket go into the flames or the casket lower into the ground, you stand there asking yourself, is this all there is to life? Born only to grow old and die. And if you don't have Jesus' resurrection, your answer is, yes, grow old and die. Grow up, grow old, and die. Is this God's purpose for us? No. Because Jesus comes to cancel that death penalty by His sacrificial death on our behalf. Never be ashamed of the resurrection. Can I plead with you now, maybe in, over the net as you listen to this, can you make it your lifestyle if you say you call yourself a Christian? Can you make it your lifestyle that no week, in fact, no day should pass in which you do not thank Jesus for His atoning death and His victorious resurrection, without which you might sing the song, Staying Alive, Staying Alive, and you ask yourself, why? And you won't have an answer. And euthanasia and suicide may be very good alternatives to your hardened heart or cynical mind or darkened perspective of life. Staying alive before Felix. Interesting that this whole account in chapter 24 ends with, after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, 
who was Jewish. She was Jewess. And he sent for Paul and then sent for Paul to hear him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. That means Paul would have told the whole salvation story of how it began with Abraham, how it passed on to Moses, how he, they entered the promised land, how they, how they became the exile, how they came back to the remnant, and how in God's timing, from the remnant, Jesus came, and Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth, is the Christ of Scripture. The two things match. Christ has always been promised in Scripture. It so happens that Jesus, born in a manger, Jesus of Nazareth, is the Christ. And as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present when I get an opportunity to summon you. Just a little bit of background about Drusilla and Felix. Felix, his brother, was the favourite minister or right-hand person of the emperor at that time. And Felix's appointment to be governor was really one of Guangxi. Right? If not for his brother, being the favourite of an emperor, he wouldn't be governor. As simple as that. This was his third marriage to Drusilla. And Drusilla, from, what I, from my reading, I understand, she was a beauty who turned heads. She was married off at 15 years old. 15 years old, sec 3. Uh. Is it? Sec 4. <laughs> 15 years old. And then... He caught eye, she caught his eye, and at 16, he married her. And so he had committed adultery. And so as he hears this thing, the righteousness, the self-control which he had none, the coming judgment, all those things perhaps grated against him. When you present the good news, there's always the bad news about yourself. If there's no bad news about yourself, there is no need for good news, is there? And so, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favour, Felix left Paul in prison. And so, Felix, next thing you know about him, not just suffers with lack of self-control, lust, adultery. He also loves money. He also fear men. That's why he kept Paul in prison. And so you add it all together, what prevented him from hearing the gospel? The love of money, the fear of men. The fear of men, the love of money. What's preventing you from hearing the gospel? Jesus is the number one speaker about money and hell. And most times when he gave parables about money, it was in the pejorative and negative. Because you cannot serve God and mammon. And so there is no news of Felix being converted, though he had every privilege to hear him, hear Paul, speak the good news about Jesus, about the righteousness of the kingdom, about the self-control of the kingdom, about the coming judgment, that all revolves around the Lord Jesus. I ask of me and ask of you, how is your hearing? He who has ears, let him hear. If you can't hear clearly the call of Jesus, could it be the fear of men, women? Could it be the love of money, the love of self? Do not leave this place without doing business about those two areas of your life. Because to fear men at the expense of the fear and the worship and love of God is a terrible, miserable exchange. To love many and miss out the Messiah is a pitiful exchange. Do not do that. And so staying alive before Festus. And so we can only summarize by the time we get to chapter 25. But Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well, if, I, if then I'm a wrongdoer, committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. Listen to that statement carefully. His highest goal is not to escape death. But there is nothing to their charges against me 
No one can give me up to them. So I, Paul, Roman citizen, appeal to Caesar. And under Roman justice and law, a Roman citizen can appeal his case all the way, in our case to the Supreme Court, in their case to the Supreme Ruler, Caesar. And so Paul the Apostle was kept alive. Main lessons as we come to a close. Paul faces two great centres of the ancient world. Jerusalem was the centre of religion, as it were. A religion that, was, that belonged to a small nation, but a religion that was well known to all the Canaanite nations among her. She was a centre of history, of religion, of tradition, that spread from when it was written over 2,000 to millennium. Rome was the centre of empire, the greatest Western empire, and the peace that it brought is called Pax Romana, the peace of Rome that came through the sharp edge of a sword. And it was the centre of civilization, and according to scholars, it stretched over 3,000 square miles. I don't want to ask us, how big is Singapore? Never mind. Next slide. Yep. So how do you, if you were Paul, plead your case against Jerusalem, the greatest religious power? And how do you then plead your case against Rome, the greatest political power, if you are accused by both courts for misdeeds on your part? Because two deadly accusations against Paul, he was accused of sacrilege against Israel, accused of sedition against Rome, both of which would see the termination of his life. And Paul's defence, as you read his sermons, his defence, he fulfilled the hope of Israel. Jesus fulfilled the hope of Israel. The message of the resurrection of Jesus was the fulfilment, not the cancelling of the hope of Israel, not the negating of the hope of Israel. And at the same time, Jesus and Paul's highest hope was not for the overthrow of Rome, but for the overthrow of Satan. Very precious lessons for us, that we are Christians are not to be known merely simplistically that we exist for the overthrow of government and the disrupt, disruption of government. We are not told to do that. Jesus never did that. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God. He came to usher in the kingdom of God of which he was king. So Paul's gospel presents him as a loyal son to Israel because same faith, same God, same hope, same ambition. And yet he was a loyal citizen of Rome. If I've done anything wrong, then please bring witnesses to substantiate the charges. And if the charges, if the witnesses stand up, sentence me. Sentence me with the sentence that I deserve. You see how classic, how wise this man was. So Paul is saved by his double denial of Roman treason and Jewish sacrilege all in one breath. In one master stroke, he does this in his life. But you know what? Paul is not saved by his own wisdom. He's actually saved by this. Acts 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him, and the Lord said to him, Take courage, Paul, for you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, where you almost got killed, but you stayed alive, and so you must also testify in Rome. And the reason he stays alive is because Jesus promised to be with him. There are very huge takeaway lessons for us as God's people. Did you notice that each character in each episode pits powerful earthly figures, centurions, tribunes, governors, kings, against tiny, puny, helpless, hopeless Apostle Paul? But through all of it was Jesus promised to never leave him or forsake him. God's sovereignty over his life. Never be afraid when you stand before authorities. 
if you walk by faith and follow the Lord Jesus. Amen? So quite some years ago, one of our members was arrested in Myanmar for doing a job. And when you get arrested in Myanmar, military junta was still in place at the time. Mona and I flew in to try and do something to be with him and rescue him. And trial after sitting after sitting after sitting, and the final sitting before the sentencing, I could see the judge. And in that country, the rule of law doesn't work, the rule of bribery works. The whole world knows that now, with the civil war that is raging. Don't forget to pray for Myanmar. As much as there's a war between Israel and Hamas, there's a war in Ukraine, there's a war closer to us called Myanmar, which is a real heartache for us in Southeast Asia. So I look at that judge. I was praying for a church member standing in court, everything done in Myanmar. I was just praying, if I believe that all authorities are under you, Lord Jesus, I see you, I literally want to see you sitting above sovereignly over this human judge who is prone to be unjust. Do you believe that? When you come up against the world, you either believe that Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and Judge, or you don't. By God's grace, our member was released and came back in time to give his testimony at the New Year's Eve dinner. Amen? That's why you must sign up for the New Year's Eve dinner. <laughs> you sit there thinking, oh, I've never heard this before. Did this happen? <laughs> yes, it did. So not so gospel and more gospel lessons. Acts 23 to 25 is not about Paul's delayed death, but God keeping him alive for the greater purpose that the good news of Jesus will reach Rome, the center of empire. Which leads us to ask, why do you think God is keeping you alive? And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says this, Do not forget in God's eyes, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. And the only reason, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand, His slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone or any race to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The only reason Jesus hasn't returned is because the gospel hasn't gone to the furthest corners, to every ethnic race. And the full number hasn't come in. That's why God has kept you alive. He keeps you alive to be a witness unto Him. Amen? I've shared this many times. My elder sister, my late elder sister, married a Japanese, she got into an accident in, in the narrow streets of Saitama where she lived, about two hours from, from, from Tokyo. And she was driving a small Suzuki, what we call a tin can car, and she went under a lorry, which took the top of the car off. And the only reason she survived was that she was short. She's barely five feet, the shortest in my family. There's no one so short. So as she was recovering in the hospital, she kept asking, why did God spare my life? I should have died in the accident. I should have died. But I didn't die because vertically challenged. And from this point onwards, she made it her prayer to never let any day pass without her being used by God to share the gospel, to witness to someone in the very hard ground of Japan, where after hundreds of years of missionary endeavor, only 2% believe in Christ. She's the best evangelist I know, the best unpaid evangelist, much better than the whole pastoral team put together. She meet you on the streets in a shopping mall. Huh? She can turn a conversation around so quickly. I, I, I've told you before, right? She sees you carrying a bunch of flowers. Let's say she meets you during Valentine's. She says, oh, beautiful flowers. Huh? Where did you buy them? Oh, you, God made those flowers. You know God made those flowers. Then she moves from God the Creator to Jesus. All in about two minutes. I stand there marveling. I'm paid, no? I'm paid to do this. Yet I cannot do this. I dare not do this. But my sister does it. So naturally. Why is God keeping you alive? So that we can share the gospel in Singapore. In a few weeks' time, if we pray sincerely and earnestly enough, we should be getting our TOP very soon. And we are stepping out by faith, right? 
that December 21st, 22nd, Market Diaries, there'll be no services at Adam and Bishan. We'll all have a combined service at Tengah. Hey, okay. I want to assure all hearers on the internet, Presbyterians, do clap. We give thanks to God. And on Christmas Day, no services at Adam and Bishan. We'll all gather, not at ACSI anymore, but now at Tengah. Hey, okay, it gets louder and louder. I, I like this part. And come to watch night service. Watch night service because there's no church in that part of the island. Very few churches in the western part of Singapore. Surely no church there where we are located in Bukit Batok West with the hinterland, the mission field of Tenga. We're going to have a watch night service and maybe people from the neighbourhood will just come and just welcome the year in with us. Amen? And then by January 4th, we have the official opening and then by January 5th, we start ministries there. We step forward by faith. Amen? And what are you to do? You are to pray, 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 participate, 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 and go where others fear to go. So the QR code for signing up comes up. Yeah. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you should have signed up by now. And so, why is God keeping us alive? To keep sharing the gospel. We had a movie night, you know, and 500 people came to our movie night. 500. It was a wonderful movie called Unsung Hero. True story. Go check it out. About, should I give it away? No, I wouldn't spoil it for you. Anyway, five, six people committed themselves to the Lord, prayed the sinner's prayer. Another 15, 20 indicated interest. And so we are starting a special discovering class for them. And that is to tell you, as much as we are preparing for the hardware to be ready, that's the easy part. The software, the people have to be prepared to carry the good news of Jesus. Amen? And there's so much excitement to see you bring your friends for that movie night. And we pray that whether it's Adam, Bishan or Tenga, will be a shining light because eight, nine out of ten Singaporeans still do not believe in Jesus as their Saviour and their Lord. And so what are we doing? We have to be yielded to the Lord Jesus. Paul was completely vulnerable in men's hands, but he was completely invincible in God's hands. As you live from day to day, that will be your experience. We are completely vulnerable by the powers that be in your office, by the powers that be in your land. But if you are a follower of Jesus, a child of God, you're completely invincible in God's hands. And you need the spiritual eyes that come from beholding the old, old message of the cross. This is the only reason, the only way, why we stay alive to the glory of God. Amen. I'm going to ask the musicians to come forward. We prepare ourselves by singing a song. Allow me to close this in prayer before we sing the song in preparation for the Holy Communion. So often as we live in a fallen world, do everything within us cries and tends towards living and being alive. Sometimes we despair and think that the ending of life is better. But in your word and through your Son, you tell us that you preserve Paul's life so that he may be used by a vessel to offer eternal life. For each and all of us who have believed in you, Lord Jesus, and accept you as our Saviour and Lord, have confessed our sins and repented, and continue to believe in you, despite the challenges, in the face of the hostility of the world, in the face of our own struggles in our own life, where we're called to put to death our old nature and to put on Christ. In hearing your word, help us to realise this is the high calling the honour and privilege you've given to us. That we offered not just life, but eternal life. For those who are seeking, God has brought you here to ask you to seek no more, but to accept the death of Jesus for you 
and the resurrection of Jesus for you and the purposes of Jesus for you by accepting Jesus as your Saviour and your Lord. In all of this, may we give eternal glory to God. Amen.